For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I search through the contents of every issue of essentially every English-language nutrition journal in the world, so you don't have to. Of course, there's lots of important nutrition articles published in other journals, cardiology, oncology, pediatrics, internal medicine, so I also search through a number of medical subject headings every day as well. I'm privileged to be biking distance from the National Library of Medicine here next to the nation's capital. Now, you know, anyone can do this. Let's say you like tangerines. You want to see what's new with your favorite fruit. You can go to pubmed.gov, type in tangerine, press Enter, and then click on Save Search. And you can have them email you every time a new article gets published anywhere in the world on the subject of tangerines, free of charge. And while you're waiting for your first tangerine email, you can always catch up on all the tangerine papers previously published in the medical literature, all 7,468 of them. Using my search criteria over the last year, 12,000 articles landed in my inbox. You can usually tell just by looking at the title and abstract if they're interesting, groundbreaking, practical. Uh, the criteria I use in picking which studies I'm going to cover each year. This year I ended up uh, downloading, categorizing, reading, analyzing about uh, 3,000 studies, which I turned into 365 videos, so I could post one a day, year-round, to my new website. Though actually a couple of months old by now, nutritionfacts.org, thanks to the generous support of the Jesse and Julie Rash Foundation. Now, 365 videos is like 12 hours, so I have to split it up across multiple discs. Volume 5, 6, and 7 cover the first few hours. This DVD you're watching now covers the next two hours, and I expect to release another uh, two or three uh, additional DVDs. And then, by summer 2012, I'll have another 12,000 articles in my inbox, and we'll do it all again next year. If I don't collapse, I do have a day job. Even though you have the DVD, I do encourage everyone to check out nutritionfacts.org. It has all the videos from all my old DVDs posted online completely free. It is the first and only non-commercial science-based website to provide free daily video updates on the latest in nutrition research. It has hundreds of videos, more than a thousand topics, and a new video is uploaded every day. You can rate videos, share videos, search videos, discuss videos. I have links to all the sources, um, uh, so you can read the entire uh, scientific paper yourself, make up your own mind, you can ask me questions, you can read my blog, you can follow the site on Twitter, follow the site on Facebook, so you can share this potentially life-changing, life-saving information with those you care about the most. There were some extraordinary reports recently about cruciferous vegetables. For example, the immunostimulatory effects of kale. So simple an experiment, I don't know why it hasn't been done before. Roll up your sleeve, take some white blood cells, drip a little kale on, and see if it boosts their ability to produce antibodies. Here's the control, no kale, which is basically the standard American diet, though if you check with the USDA, we do consume, as a country annually per capita, 0.2%. 28793567 and change pounds, that's a cup of kale per person per year. So the average American is responsible for eating about a half teaspoon of kale a week, and kale consumption is in decline. So anyways, here's the control. Then you start adding a billionth of a gram of kale protein per liter, just slightly less than U.S. consumption, and Look at that spike, quadrupling antibody production with kale. These data provide valuable information to confirm yet another beneficial function of kale. Now, that's for raw kale. What if you cooked it? And not just cooked it, but cooked it to death. Boiled it for half an hour. What do you think happened? Did boiling abolish its immunostimulatory effect? Here's the control again. The filled circles will be the cooked, the unfilled, the raw. And the cooked appeared to work even better. This landmark study on the immune system boosting effects of kale concluded that the intake of kale might provide a beneficial effect on humans to enhance the defense against such pathogens as viruses, bacteria, and toxins. 
the immunostimulating effect will provide an additional advantage of kale, as well as its antioxidative capacity and other effects. Other effects like improving coronary artery disease risk factors. Did you know that kale juice has gained increasing attention as one of the most popular health-promoting foods in Japan? I'm packing my bags. 32 men with high cholesterol consumed three or four shots of kale juice a day for three months. That's like eating a total of about 30 pounds of kale, the amount the average American consumes in a century. What happened? Did they turn green, start to photosynthesize? What it did was dramatically lower their bad cholesterol, and boosted their good cholesterol as much as would an hour of daily exercise seven days a week. Obviously, by the end of the three months, the antioxidant level of their blood shot up significantly, though not as much in the smokers. I can just imagine some guy with a cigarette in one hand and his you know, shot of kale juice in the other. The researchers suggest that this is because the smokers were actively using all those antioxidants up. When smoking can use up the antioxidants contained in the equivalent of 200 cups of kale, you know it's time to quit. The best way to study DNA repair is to study smokers, because they need a lot of it. A group of smokers, for a total of 10 days, were asked to eat six times more broccoli than the average American consumes, in other words, a single stalk. Compared to smokers not eating broccoli, those who did suffered about 30% less DNA damage over those 10 days. Maybe it was because the broccoli boosted the detoxifying enzymes in their livers, and so the carcinogens never made it to their DNA? Well, they tested for that. They actually took some DNA out of their bodies, put it in a test tube, and exposed it to a known DNA-damaging chemical. The DNA of broccoli eaters suffered significantly less damage. The DNA of those eating broccoli appears intrinsically more resistant at a subcellular level. In conclusion, in the present study, the intake of broccoli seems protective, as far as DNA damage is concerned in smokers who are exposed to oxidative stress. Over the last decade, a new theory of cancer biology has emerged— the cancer stem cell. Normal stem cells are involved in organ repair. Uh, stained here in red, they travel around the body, sit and wait until there's some damage, and step in and replace whatever structures are necessary. Lost the little skin here, bone or muscle there, need to regrow a new tooth? These cells are ready and willing. And the best part, they're built to last a lifetime. But those same qualities— migration, colonization, proliferation, self-renewal, immortality— can be used against us when stem cells go bad and decide to build tumors instead. Cancer stem cells may explain cancer spread and cancer recurrence. That may be why cancer tends to come back. There may be no cure, only remission. You can have a breast cancer relapse 20 to 25 years after you thought it went away, thanks potentially to cancer stem cells. Our current armamentarium of chemo, drugs, and radiation is based on animal models. If the tumor shrinks, it's a success. But lab rats only live two or three years. All these new fancy therapies like you know, anti-angiogenesis, you know, cutting off the blood supplies to tumors, that's great. But the cancer stem cells may be like, fine, I'll go somewhere else and grow another tumor. What we need is to strike at the root of cancer, treatments aimed not at just reducing tumor bulk, but rather at targeting the quote-unquote beating heart of the tumor, the cancer stem cell. Enter broccoli. Sulforaphane a dietary component of broccoli and broccoli sprouts, appears to inhibit breast cancer stem cells. Breast tissue naturally has lots of stem cells, right? Your body never knows when you're going to get pregnant and start, you know, have to start making a lot of new milk glands. Researchers recently discovered this 
compound in broccoli that may destroy cancerous stem cells and keep them from going rogue in the first place. Estrogen receptor positive human breast tumor. Here's an estrogen receptor negative breast tumor. Let's add some broccoli juice. Going, going, nearly gone. Stem cell hot spots before and after the broccoli. Broccoli and broccoli sprouts produce a compound, sulforaphane, that appears to target breast cancer cells. But this is in a test tube. Right? How do we even know we absorb sulforaphane into our bloodstream when we eat broccoli? And even if we do, how much do we have to eat to arrive at these test tube concentrations where it counts, in breast tissue itself, where a tumor may be evolving? An innovative group at Hopkins figured it out. Let's find women scheduled for breast reduction surgery, and an hour before they go into the operating room, have them drink some broccoli sprout juice. And that's what they did. They collected breast tissue from eight women an hour after broccoli, and here's what they found. An average of 2 picomoles per milliliter in their left breasts, and 1.45 in their right. So now, for the first time ever, not only do we know that the broccoli we eat ends up in the right place, but we know the final tissue concentration. So what does that correspond to here? This is what broccoli sprouts do to boast estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative breast cancer cells. To continually bathe the tissues of one's breast at these, this concentration, you'd have to eat a quarter of a cup of broccoli sprouts a day, a half a cup, and about a cup and a quarter. In other words, it's doable. I just put them on my salad. Real-world effects at real-world doses. Targeting cancer stem cells, protecting DNA, doesn't even scratch the surface of what broccoli and broccoli sprouts appear capable of. Here's a sampling published in just one random month anti-carcinogenic, anti-inflammatory. Another anti-inflammatory may protect against colorectal cancer, help fight cervical cancer, may protect against sunburn, for goodness sake, and protect cartilage. And that's just one month in the medical journals. What's the catch? There has to be a downside. Well, in Turkey recently, a report of liver toxicity thought due to juiced broccoli. 56-year-old woman drinking about 3.5 cups of pure broccoli juice a day for a month. A commentator balked at the assumption that the broccoli juice per se was responsible for liver toxicity, suggesting that a more likely possibility is that the pesticide residue levels in such a large daily quantity of the vegetable were such that they adversely affected her liver cells. Three and a half cups of juice is equivalent to eating about 18 cups of broccoli a day. 18 cups a day for four weeks, that's 500 cups of broccoli. Even if it were organic broccoli, 500 cups a month is a lot of broccoli. This was just a case report, thankfully. Formal human toxicity studies have been done. Here, for example, they gave some volunteers a week of broccoli sprout extract, equaling the sulforaphane content of about two dozen cups of broccoli a day, and no problems were found. It's nice to know there were no apparent adverse effects at even 27 cups of broccoli a day's worth of these cruciferous phytonutrients, but there has to be some point at which it becomes toxic, and indeed there is. Some researchers in Italy tried to push the envelope. They're trying to come up with an IV infusion dose to use as actual chemotherapy, and so wanted to know how high they could go. And yes, there was a level at which you can cause DNA damage at the equivalent of about 100 cups of broccoli a day, or actually just 4 cups of broccoli sprouts. They conclude no sign of DNA lesions could be observed at nutritionally attainable concentrations. But that's not really true. I mean, you could eat 
four cups of the sprouts a day. See, they don't know health nuts like I know some health nuts. Uh, someone uh, came up to me after a lecture a few years ago uh, down in Florida and said how he heard that you know, wheatgrass juice was so good for you, cleans you out, and so he wanted to try stuffing himself with it. So he told me he calculated the volume of the human digestive tract, all 10 yards or so, and proceeded to drink that amount continuously, quart after quart, until it started coming out the other end. So I asked him, well, what happened? And he looked up at me with an expression I can only describe as rapture, and no joke, said, it was volcanic. There's lots of talk these days about detoxing, but talk is cheap. Our liver is actually doing it all day, every day, and if we want to detoxify, the best thing we can do is boost our liver's own detoxifying enzymes. And sulforaphane is the most potent natural phase II enzyme inducer known. That's one of our liver's detoxification systems. So where do we find this stuff? Broccoli, which produces more than any other known plant in the world. In micromoles per gram seed fresh weight, broccoli's number one. Then kohlrabi and cauliflower gets the bronze. It's interesting. Broccoli raw, you know, which is all gourmet, expensive, is it worth the extra price? No. Broccoli raw produces about 500 times less than broccoli. Broccoli is an exceptional source of sulforaphane, but at the same time, there's none actually in the vegetable, until you bite it. You know those chemical flares or glow sticks where you snap them and two chemicals in two different departments mix and sets off a reaction? Broccoli does the same thing. In one part of the cell it keeps an enzyme called myrosinase, and in another part it keeps something called glucoraphanin. Uh, there is no sulforaphane, which is what we want, anywhere in the broccoli until some herbivore starts chewing on the poor thing. Cells get crushed, the enzyme mixes with the glucoraphanin, which is a type of glucosinolate, and sulforaphane is born, and the herbivore is like, ew, this tastes like broccoli, and runs away. The plant uses it as a defense against you know, nibblers and noshers. Little did broccoli count on a little lemon juice and some garlic, maybe a little tahini dressing. It's our counterattack. Just make sure to chew, otherwise you won't get as much of that magical mixture. In this study, they had people just swallow broccoli sprouts whole, day one, and got some action. Obviously their stomach stepped in and did a little churning, but on day three, when they actually got to chew their sprouts, you can see significantly more got absorbed into their bodies. Chew it or lose it. You'll hear folks in the raw food community waxing poetic about enzymes, the importance of preserving the activities of plant enzymes which are destroyed by cooking. Skeptics, on the other hand, indignantly assert that we have no use for plant enzymes since we're animals and make all the enzymes we need. Well, both sides are wrong. There are two known examples of plant enzymes serving physiologically useful functions, and the production of sulforaphane is one of them. One of our most powerful phytonutrients, it is formed by an enzyme in broccoli. You cut or chew or chop up broccoli or broccoli sprouts, and the enzyme is released, and it gets to work making us a big batch of phytonutrient goodness. Cooking inactivates the enzymes, though, so steamed broccoli doesn't have any. So why have experiments shown detectable sulforaphane levels in the blood and urine of people eating only cooked broccoli? Now I'm really confused. Were they sneaking raw broccoli on the side? No. How cool is this? Good bacteria that reside in our gut have the raw broccoli enzyme too. So as soon as the cooked broccoli gets down there, the bacteria make sulforaphane for us. And the way they figure this out is that you incubate cooked vegetable juice with fresh human feces, and voila! 
sulforaphane is born. Not as much, though. To get the same amount of benefit in a cup of raw broccoli, you'd have to eat 10 cups of cooked broccoli. So I encourage people to try to eat their broccoli raw, or alternatively, chop the raw broccoli up first, wait 40 minutes for the uh, enzyme to do its business, and then you can cook the heck out of it because the enzyme's job is already done. So the next time you want to make broccoli soup, put it in the blender raw, blend, wait, then cook. Safer, too, since you're not trying to blend hot liquids at the end. Or if you don't want to wait, you can— you know those uh, prepackaged bags of you know, pre-chopped broccoli in the produce aisle? More expensive, but more convenient, and maybe even healthier because it's been building up anti-carcinogens the whole time in the store. For more on raw food controversies, I encourage everyone to go to their local library and check out Davis and Molina's Becoming Raw, which does the best job to date summarizing the available evidence. What else can broccoli do? Breast cancer is the most common cancer among women in the United States, but lung is actually the number one cancer killer of women. About 85% of women with breast cancer are still alive five years later. But lung cancer is picked up so late that the numbers reversed. 85% of lung cancer victims are dead, and 90% of those deaths are from metastases, the lung cancer spreading to other parts in the body. Well, broccoli seem to be able to do everything else. What about suppressing the metastatic potential of human lung cancer cells? Check. What they did to assess cancer cell migration is laid down a layer of cancer in a petri dish, and then cut a swath down the middle. Within 24 hours, the cancer was creeping back, and by 30 hours closed the gap completely, until they started dripping some cruciferous compounds on them. As you can see, the cancer cells seemed almost paralyzed, right? kind of stuck in place. They don't seem to want to go anywhere anytime soon. In their conclusion, they talk about the anti-proliferative, anti-tumor effects of these broccoli family dietary compounds, ending with a Latin phrase rarely seen in scholarly literature, since it's just so nondescript. But in this case, they evidently felt it necessary. These compounds have inhibitory effects on several types of cancer cell growth, such as leukemia, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, etc. A few years ago, in an analysis of antioxidants per unit cost, I concluded that red cabbage, purple cabbage, was the most nutrition you could get for your money. Yes, there are healthier foods out there, but not healthier foods for the same amount of money. I encouraged everyone to always make sure they have a purple cabbage in their crisper to slice off shreds to put in whatever they could, last for weeks, cheap, convenient, and one of the healthiest things on the planet all still absolutely true. My new calculations, though, suggest they just got one-upped by DIY broccoli sprouts. Do it yourself. Broccoli sprout seeds start out like this. You can buy them online or at your local health food store in bulk for about 20 bucks a pound, but that makes about 75 cups of sprouts. So it comes out to be about 25 cents per cup. And as we saw before, in terms of sulforaphane content, that's equivalent to eating about 27 cups of broccoli. So that's like going to the store and buying broccoli for a penny a cup. Even purple cabbage has got to give it up for broccoli sprouts. Start out with a mason jar with some kind of screen top, a tablespoon of seeds, soak them overnight, drain in the morning, and then rinse twice daily. So day two, day three, day four, and then you can enjoy the bounty. One tablespoon of seeds makes about two cups of sprouts. Since it takes uh, four or five days, though, sometimes I'll have five jars in constant rotation. It can be in the middle of the winter, and I'm growing my own salad. Every day you get cups of fresh produce for pennies without ever having to go to the store. Though there are thousands of new studies on nutrition published every year, the overall thrust of the findings are remarkably consistent. As Michael Pollan summed up, eat 
food, meaning not junk, mostly plants. But I diligently continue to scour the medical literature every year, open-minded. You never know what you're going to find. Rarely does something truly throw me for a loop, but I did put my fork down for a few moments after I opened up a journal only to find a case report entitled The Dangers of Broccoli. First little background. A Roux-en-Y gastric bypass surgery is when you cut out 90% of the stomach. You chop the small intestine in half and staple it to the bottom of your esophagus. So instead of swallowing food into your stomach and then out through your intestines, this whole region is cut out of the loop. The stomach is bypassed. The food just kind of goes straight down into the little pouch, which is a little chunk of what used to be the top of the stomach. Uh, so you can only eat like a thumbful of food at a time. Your entire meal is a quarter cup, or else you're in trouble. Which brings us back here. 316-pound woman, three months post-operative at an all-you-can-eat buffet. I don't like where this is going. She was so good, though, choosing really healthy foods. She just forgot to chew. Her staples blew, ended up in the ER, then the OR. They opened her up and found full chunks of broccoli, whole lima beans, and other green leafy vegetables inside her abdominal cavity. Uh, the vegetables were almost completely fully formed without evidence of having been chewed. A cautionary tale to be sure, but less about chewing food better after surgery than about chewing better foods before, so you can keep all your internal organs intact. For years I've been presenting data on how we can best tune our diet to prevent cancer. But if you already have it, uh, there's been a burst of new research lately on cancer survival, which I'd like to share. For example, we used to tell cancer patients to rest, uh, conserve their energy. But now there's evidence that cancer survivors may survive longer if they exercise. But what about diet? Where are the data? Well, we know that eating cruciferous vegetables like broccoli may help prevent bladder cancer, so I guess it should come to no surprise that broccoli may help with survival as well. Uh, this was a study done at Roswell Park uh, following a few hundred bladder cancer patients for about eight years. Of course, many didn't live that long, but in teasing out which factors seemed to improve survival, they found that raw broccoli consumption appeared the most powerful. Cooked broccoli wasn't useless, but this definitely makes sense given the whole sulforaphane story I talked about before. Eating just a single serving or more a month of raw broccoli was associated with half the cancer mortality. If you know anyone with bladder cancer, go buy them some broccoli, or even better, a broccoli seed sprouting kit. Fruit and vegetable intake also improved survival from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially green leafy vegetables and citrus. Though it is sobering to note that only 22% of the patients in the study followed public health recommendations for the minimum intake of fruits and vegetables, suggesting that the lymphoma diagnosis may be an important teachable moment to improve diet and other health behaviors. If a cancer diagnosis can't get someone to eat their greens, I'm afraid nothing will. Though small consolation, one benefit of the fact that breast cancer is now the number one cancer among women is that breast cancer survival is a very active area of research. For example, this major 2011 study, which followed about 4,000 women with breast cancer for seven years. Not all of them made it. The researchers tried to figure out if there were any dietary factors that may have been associated with their early demise. They found two things, and the first was saturated fat intake. Those women who ate the most saturated fat after diagnosis increased the risk of dying in those seven years by 41%. So where is saturated fat found in our diet so we can avoid it? The you know, first thing people tend to think of when they think of saturated fat is beef, right? like a big fat juicy steak, but no, beef doesn't even make the top five. This is from the National Cancer Institute. Number one, cheese. Number two, pizza, which is basically another way of saying cheese. Number three, grain-based desserts, which means primarily cakes, cookies, and donuts, 
which is why pink donuts may not be the best way to celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The number four ice cream and number five chicken. And you thought pink donuts were bad? I'm not making this up. And of course, you know, grilling and frying meats makes them particularly carcinogenic due to the heterocyclic amine formation. So KFC better donate to breast cancer research. You've heard me talk about this before, right? Chicken is not a low-fat food, even skinless and steamed, and it is in fact one of the top five contributors of saturated fat in the American diet. Then comes pork, burgers, Mexi, which uses a lot of lard, beef, and number 10, reduced fat milk, which you may think, wait, that's, that's only 2% fat, right? Uh, but that's 2% by weight, not by calories, which is what matters in the body. Reduced fat milk is actually 30% fat. <laughs> it's like if you took a stick of butter and dunked it into a cup of water and said, see, now it's only 50% fat. No, it's still 100% fat. I mean, the water doesn't count. Right? But anyways, uh, these are the top 10 foods to stay away from to decrease our saturated fat intake, which may not only help prevent breast cancer in the first place, but to improve survival for those that have it. With a growing number of breast cancer survivors, there's tremendous interest in establishing whether changes in lifestyle influence breast cancer outcome. So started the introduction of this 2011 study, suggesting two things about our diet can significantly alter the survival of women with breast cancer. We talked about one already, saturated fat, increasing one's risk of dying 41%, and what foods to avoid. The second factor was even more significant, trans fat, increasing one's risk of dying 78% after diagnosis within a seven-year period. How do we avoid that stuff? Once again, cakes, cookies, and animal products top the list. And then it's basically margarine, french fries, potato chips, and Crisco. So, Junk food and animal products may be contributing to a 78% increase in mortality in women already burdened with breast cancer. As the federal 2010 dietary guidelines concluded for everyone, not just those with cancer, Americans should keep their intake of trans fatty acids as low as possible. Breast cancer is initially so slow growing that Women may have tumors years or even decades before they're diagnosed. So it makes sense that the same dietary factors that help grow the tumor in the first place would keep goading it on before and after diagnosis. This is not always the case, evidently. Uh, alcohol, for example, strongly associated with breast cancer risk, but once you already have a full-blown tumor, it may not make a difference if you continue to drink or not. But in general, the same diet that helps prevent breast cancer appears to be the same type of diet that's going to help prolong survival. That seemed to be the case in this recent New York study. It started out with about 1,000 women with breast cancer, ended up with less than 1,000. must be so sad to do these survival studies. You never know who's going to make it to the end. Several investigations have suggested that plant-based diets rich in fruits, vegetables, and grains, as well as their related nutrients, may have a beneficial effect on survival after breast cancer. Evidence pointed to lignans, phytonutrients found throughout the plant kingdom. We know they may prevent breast cancer. Now we know dietary lignin intake is associated with improved survival among postmenopausal women with breast cancer. In fact, it appeared to cut mortality risk in half. Where do you find it? Well, there's some in red wine, whole grains, vegetables like kale, big jump to sesame seeds, and then meteoric rise to flax seeds. Let me squish down the scale here. Look at that. Nothing comes close to flax. The Long Island Breast Cancer Study Project estimated the quantity of lignans Long Island women average on a daily basis. From their entire diet, about 6 mg a day. That's how many lignans are found in a single teaspoon of flax seeds. So you add just a 
teaspoon to your diet, and you may have just doubled your entire intake for the day. Just maybe not during the last two trimesters of pregnancy, as preliminary data suggests flax use may increase the risk of preterm delivery. Flax has the highest content of lignans of all plant foods used for human consumption. The reason lignans is in quotes is because flax doesn't actually contain any lignans. Just like broccoli doesn't actually contain sulforaphane, flax does contain lignin precursors, though, which the good bacteria in our gut turn into lignans, which we can then absorb, so lignans are more of a team effort. We used to think our colon was just some transit tube that absorbed excess water. Now we know it houses what could be considered an entirely separate organ inside the body. Our gut flora are trillions of good bacteria, the densest concentration of microbes found anywhere on Earth. Exceeding the metabolic capacity of our liver by a factor of 100, our good bacteria detoxify some compounds and activate others, boosting their bioavailability. In fact, that may be why urinary tract infections have been associated with breast cancer risk. The rounds of antibiotics may be wiping out some of the good bacteria that are helping us take advantage of all the wonders of a plant-based diet. I think most people only tend to think of our gut bacteria when there's a problem, but having good gut flora is more than just avoiding diarrhea. It's about maximizing our absorption of phytonutrients in our diet. What about soy food intake and breast cancer survival? We didn't have a clue until 2009 when the LACE study was published, Life After Cancer Epidemiology. About 2,000 California breast cancer survivors followed for nine years. Postmenopausal women on the estrogen-blocking drug tamoxifen, who got the most of the soy isoflavone in their diet, had the lowest rate of breast cancer recurrence. Uh, appeared to cut breast cancer recurrence in half. Soy was, if anything, protective. But you can't just sprinkle some soy sauce. It took soy levels comparable to those consumed in Asian populations, one or two servings a day, to reduce the risk of cancer coming back. Then came the famous Journal of the American Medical Association study, the biggest yet, 5,000 breast cancer survivors. Conclusion. Among women with breast cancer, soy food consumption was significantly associated with decreased risk of death and recurrence. Now this isn't taking you know, soy isoflavone supplements. This was actually eating soy foods. The potential benefits are confined to soy foods, and inferences should not be made about the risk or benefits of soy-containing dietary supplements. Patients with breast cancer can be assured that enjoying a soy latte or indulging in pad thai with tofu causes no harm, and when consumed in plentiful amounts, may reduce the risk of disease recurrence. And finally, 2011 soy food consumption and breast cancer prognosis, a third study, the only three such studies in existence, and soy is three for three. As isoflavone intake increased, risk of death decreased. What more do we need to know? One of the reasons it's so difficult to study the relationship between diet and cancer is because many dietary behaviors are associated with non-dietary behaviors. For example, the reason we used to think coffee drinking caused cancer was because people who drink coffee are more likely to have a cigarette in the other hand. When you factor that out, though, for example by looking at just non-smokers who do or don't drink coffee, we find that, if anything, coffee consumption may reduce the total cancer incidence. Not by much, but overall, according to the latest review, an increase in consumption of one cup of coffee per day was associated with about a 3% reduced risk of cancers, especially bladder cancer, breast cancer, mouth, colorectal, endometrial, esophageal, liver, leukemic, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. Coffee beans aren't really beans, but one is, after all, just soaking a powdered seed in some water, so a reduction in cancer risk? Not that surprising. Yes, coffee may reduce cancer risk, 
But what about the caffeine? Oh, you mean the substance that increases energy availability and expenditure, decreases fatigue and the sense of effort associated with physical activity, enhances physical, motor, and cognitive performance, increases alertness, wakefulness, and feelings of energy, decreases mental fatigue, quickens reactions, increases their accuracy, increases the ability to concentrate, focus attention, enhances short-term memory, the ability to solve problems, the ability to make correct decisions, enhancing cognitive functioning capacities and neuromuscular coordination, and in otherwise healthy non-pregnant adults is safe. That caffeine? What do they mean by moderate amounts, though? Up to 1,000 mg, about 10 cups of coffee a day. What about this, though? A case of fatal caffeine poisoning. 21-year-old woman, 10,000 mg of caffeine by swallowing a bottle of caffeine pills. The equivalent of about 100 cups of coffee at one time is indeed too much. The non-pregnant is an important caveat, though. New advice has been issued to restrict caffeine intake in pregnancy to under just 200 mg a day. The same reason it was so difficult to study cancer among coffee drinkers is the same reason it's so difficult to study cancer among meat eaters. Even if they found lower cancer rates among those eating vegetarian, maybe it's just because vegetarians exercise more, or, or smoke less, or inhale less diesel fumes because they all own a Prius. So the way you get around that is you study a group of healthy meat eaters, who, for example, smoke just as infrequently as the group of vegetarians you're trying to study, uh, to equal things out, to control for non-dietary factors. So you don't just classify people into meat eaters, fish-only eaters, and vegetarians. You adjust for smoking, past smoking, current smoking, the amount of smoking, uh, cigarette smoking, cigar smoking, pipe smoking, alcohol consumption, right? body mass index, physical activity level, and for women, how many children they've had, uh, which can be protective against breast cancer, uh, whether they're on the pill or not. Right? Anything they could think of to factor everything else aside and just focus in on what they were interested in, whether or not one eats meat. Now, controlling for obesity is really not fair to the vegetarians. We know that vegetarians are significantly more likely to be thin, which we know is protective against cancer, so by comparing vegetarians only to thin meat-eaters, it undercuts one of the benefits of eating vegetarian. It effectively erases one of the reasons why eating vegetarian may reduce cancer rates. But they weren't interested in indirect ways in which meat might cause cancer, like you know, meat leading to obesity leading to cancer. They wanted to study meat and cancer more directly. And to do that, you have to handicap the vegetarians even further. Maybe the reasons vegetarians are so healthy is not because they eat less meat, but because they eat more plants. So vegetarians were compared to meat eaters who, on average, ate about the same amount of fruits and vegetables every day. It may not have been easy, but they were able to dig up thousands of meat eaters who ate four to five servings of fruits and veggies a day, about as much as the vegetarians were eating. Again. This puts vegetarians at a comparative disadvantage by removing one of the key benefits of a more plant-based diet, which is more plants. By comparing vegetarians to omnivores who don't eat a lot of meat and have a high fruit and vegetable intake, this could reduce the chance of observing lower cancer rates in vegetarians, but they wanted to isolate out the meat component, so they did. They compared vegetarians only to healthy meat eaters with healthier diets, and still found the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among vegetarians. Yes, the incidence of all malignant cancers combined was lower among fish-only eaters and vegetarians compared to the healthy meat eaters, but the most striking difference between the dietary groups was in the risk for the group of cancers that include lymphomas and myeloma. Since they factored out other lifestyle differences between the meat-eaters and vegetarians, similar smoking, exercise, weight, fruit and veggie consumption, they concluded that meat itself may be the culprit, potentially due to the mutagenic compounds or viruses in meat, but that raised the question, what type of meat? To get at that level of detail, you would need to look at a lot of people, so they enrolled the help of not just any study, but the EPIC study, E-P-I-C, the largest forward-looking study on diet and cancer in human history, following a half million people 
for over 10 years now. What type of meat was the worst? They looked at red meat, beef and pork, processed meat like a bacon, ham, and sausage, poultry, chicken, and turkey, also offal, which true to its name means uh, entrails and organs. In practical terms, that's you know, liver, heart, kidneys, pancreas, blood, thymus, brain, stomach, feet, tongue, tail, as well as the head and eyeballs. They also looked at eggs and dairy. Which was most significantly associated with the risk of developing lymphoma? Red meat, processed meat, poultry, offal, eggs, or milk? It was poultry consumption, associated with a significantly increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, all grades of follicular lymphoma, B-cell lymphomas in general, including B-cell chronic lymphatic leukemia, including small lymphocytic leukemia and pro-lymphocytic lymphocytic leukemia, up to triple the rates for every 50 grams of daily poultry consumption. Uh, a cooked chicken breast averages over 200 grams, so that's for just a quarter of a chicken breast worth of poultry. Why was there so much more lymphoma and leukemia risk among those eating just a small serving of chicken a day? The reasons are unclear. Certainly there are industrial carcinogens like dioxins that may increase risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and have been found in meat and dairy, but the study did not observe an increased risk in association with high milk consumption, so that's probably not it. Secondly, poultry may contain oncogenic or cancer-causing viruses, especially if the meat is not cooked well. And it's interesting, there are actually studies in the U.S. reporting a lower risk of lymphoma in women consuming well-done meat. You'd think it'd be the other way around because of the heterocyclic amines, the cooked meat carcinogens created when you grill chicken. But not if it's the viruses in chicken that are responsible. Then the hotter you cook it, right, the more viruses you wipe out. Oncogenic animal viruses, cancer-causing animal viruses, have been suspected as causes of lymphoma among farmers and slaughterhouse workers, but this is just preliminary. Right? Meat consumption has not been connected with transmission of oncogenic viruses yet. And their third theory, why poultry was so significantly associated with blood and lymph node cancers, is maybe it's because chickens and turkeys are often treated with antiparasitic drugs and antibiotics to enhance growth of the animals and to treat and prevent disease, especially given the conditions in which many of them are now raised. And indeed, antibiotic use has sometimes been associated with risk of lymphoma. However, it's you know, unclear whether the association between antibiotic use and cancer risk is cause and effect, and more importantly, whether antibiotic use in food animals uh, can affect cancer risk in human beings. Bottom line, we just don't know yet why the cancer-chicken connection. Last year I presented the study on poultry slaughterhouse workers, where they were found to have excess cancers of the mouth, nasal cavities, throat tonsils, inner ear cancer, sinus cancer, esophageal, rectal, liver, leukemia, etc thought to be because they were exposed to cancer-causing viruses present in poultry and poultry products, and worse, that it may be transmitted to anyone in the general population handling or eating inadequately cooked chicken. It's not clear how you're supposed to not handle raw chicken unless you can levitate it into the oven through telekinesis. The study was replicated recently in the largest such investigation. To date, more than 20,000 workers in poultry slaughtering and packing plants, they found the same thing, confirming the findings of three other studies to date that workers in poultry slaughtering and processing plants have increased risk of dying from certain cancers. New findings, though, in the study were increased risk of death from cancers of the cervix and penis. Excess cancer of the penis in all males in the study exposed to poultry, with a standardized mortality ratio more than eightfold higher, right? not just penile cancer, but dying from it. To recap, certain viruses commonly infect and cause a wide variety of cancers in chickens and turkeys destined for human consumption. They include the avian leukosis sarcoma viruses, reticuloendotheliosis viruses, and Marek's disease virus. The avian leukosis sarcoma viruses and reticuloendotheliosis viruses are among the most potent cancer-causing agents known, and can induce cancer in poultry in a matter of days. 
This is what Marek's disease looks like. You can see all the little tumors uh, in the skin. It can also affect the chicken's eyes. Uh, what about people, though? Well, these viruses are found present in raw poultry products, including raw or inadequately cooked poultry meat and eggs meant for human consumption, as uh, well as vaccines grown in eggs. They cite a study in which researchers went looking for avian leukosis sarcoma virus, a carcinogenic retrovirus found in commercial eggs right off of supermarket shelves, and found 14%. 14% of egg samples from 20 randomly chosen New Orleans retail stores tested positive for the virus. Thus, the general population is commonly exposed. It is therefore of great interest whether these agents also cause cancer in humans. We don't know for sure, but this large study provides evidence that a human group with high exposure to poultry oncogenic or cancer-causing viruses has increased risk of dying from several cancers. Beyond just poultry workers, with regards to the general population, the public health implication that the excess occurrence of some of these cancers in these workers may be associated with exposure to oncogenic viruses is not trivial. More cancer mortality associated with poultry exposure. What about non-cancer mortality? The root cause of many chronic diseases in humans is, after all, still unknown. Uh, chickens and turkeys destined for human consumption in their products are infected with a plethora of transmissible agents that cause a variety of diseases in the animals, including cancer, a disease of the nervous system, cardiovascular diseases, kidney diseases, etc. That's in the animals, but they are a potential source of infection for humans. Humans can be infected by direct contact with the live or killed birds, their blood and secretions, right, the so-called you know, chicken juice in the, in the package of raw meat, uh, consumption of raw or inadequately cooked poultry meat or other products such as eggs and vaccination. We already have serologic evidence, uh, testing for antibodies, that humans are commonly infected with chicken viruses, uh, avian leukosis sarcoma viruses, reticuloendotheliosis viruses, and Marek's disease virus, uh, that cause a wide variety of cancer, neurologic, and other diseases in chickens and turkeys. The question therefore arises as to whether these agents also cause similar diseases in humans, especially those human diseases whose cause is currently undetermined. They figured, look, if it's going to affect anyone, it would be the poultry workers first. And indeed, they found that compared to the control group, an excess of deaths was observed for disorders of the thyroid gland, senile and presenile psychotic conditions like schizophrenia, anterior horn cell disease, which is a degenerative spinal cord condition, myasthenia gravis, and autoimmune nerve disease. Uh, hypertension, heart disease, disease of the esophagus, peritonitis, which is inflammation of the abdominal lining, and uh, other diseases of the kidney. They conclude that this apparent excess occurrence of disease affecting several organs and systems is probably originating from widespread infection with a variety of microorganisms. So this notion that the present findings may perhaps be providing the first clues that cases of some of the neurologic diseases that occur in the general human population may owe their origin to the presence of transmissible agents present in animals and animal products used for food, such as poultry, is plausible. There is one neurological condition definitively caused by an infectious agent in poultry, Guillain-Barré syndrome, also known as acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is as bad as it sounds. It's a brutally rapid, life-threatening autoimmune attack on your own nervous system. It's like MS in fast-forward, where instead of taking years, you can end up paralyzed on a ventilator in a matter of days. Why would our immune systems do such a thing? It didn't mean to. It had the best of intentions. There's a neuropathic strain of a fecal bacteria called Campylobacter contaminating the U.S. chicken supply. If you get exposed and infected, 999 times out of 1,000 you just get sick. Food poisoning. Right? No problem, your immune system wipes out the invaders. In a couple days you're as good as new. But one in 1,000 cases our immune system makes an honest mistake. 
this is what your nerve cells look like on the outside, uh, on a molecular level. This is what Campylobacter looks like on the outside. Right? Your immune system detects the bacteria, rides in, guns a-blazing, takes no prisoners, and your nerves end up a victim of friendly fire. Your first symptom is what's called ascending paralysis. Weakness starts in hands and feet and works its way up in a matter uh, in many cases, within hours or days, you can't walk, then you can't swallow, then you can't breathe, in which case you're dead, unless you can get to an ICU with a mechanical ventilator, uh, in which case after about two weeks something amazing happens. Your immune system steps back from the fight, surveys the damage, and says, uh-oh, and, uh, and it stops, and you come back to life. Uh, now it's sometimes too late, and you end up with severe lifelong disability, or you don't even make it that far. It I mean, kills people, even in the, the best ICUs in the world. The bottom line is that now that polio was largely a thing of the past, the most common cause of acute paralysis in the United States is ultimately chicken consumption. More than half of the retail poultry in the world is contaminated with the food poisoning bacteria Campylobacter. About 50% of European poultry, 60% of North American retail, more than 70% in the United States, most of which were recently reported to be antibiotic resistant. But not all strains of Campylobacter can trigger human paralysis. Not all strains have that molecular mimic. Researchers at Hopkins and UCLA recently looked into the prevalence of the potentially neuropathic strains of Campylobacter in commercial poultry products right off of supermarket shelves. Of 65 isolates of Campylobacter, they found only about 60% were in the three classes most associated with the development of paralysis. So the odds may be only 50-50 you know, or so that you might be bringing home something that could trigger Guillain-Barre syndrome. Even if you make the wrong choice, though, I mean, who undercooks chicken? I mean, you know, eggs I can see. People like their sunny-side-up yolk a little runny, or a burger that's you know, a little pink inside. But who wants rare chicken? Right? That's not the main problem. It's not the undercooking, it's the cross-contamination. Once that meat thermometer hits the right temperature, any and all fecal contamination is cooked. You could let your kids play with it. You could rub your toothbrush on it. Right? All viruses and bacteria are dead. Uh, I mean, you could uh, still I don't know, you know, choke on a chicken bone, puncture an artery, bleed to death, but the you know, infectious disease problem with chicken is between when you first touch the package at the store and when it finally makes it into the pot. You can have you know, all the safe cooking labels you want, but that won't you know, raise awareness that bacteria from the surface of the chicken meat can stick to the hands of the cook, or could be spread in the kitchen environment, and subsequently may contaminate ready-to-eat foods like salads or you know, already cooked foods accompanying the meal. Why don't we have that kind of label instead of just safe cooking? Consumer surveys show that the majority of people want to see that kind of information on food packaging. Right? Why not just name poultry, meat, and eggs as likely contamination sources with foodborne pathogens like Salmonella and Campylobacter? Right? Good for consumer safety, public health. But from an industry point of view, the problem with that is that it's been shown that this sort of naming and blaming infection risks to poultry, meat, and eggs may result in a drop of poultry, meat, and egg consumption. In terms of cross-contamination of fecal bacteria, what about just picking up packages of meat at the store? From CDC researchers published recently in the Journal of Food Protection, riding in shopping carts and exposure to raw meat and poultry products, prevalence of and factors associated with this risk factor for salmonella and campylobacter infection in children younger than three years. Riding in a shopping cart next to raw meat or poultry is a risk factor for salmonella and campylobacter infections in infants. Uh, kids riding in the basket had 18 times the odds of exposure compared to those placed backwards in the seats. Right? Several simple steps are likely to help reduce infants and children's exposure to raw meat or poultry products at the grocery store, thereby reducing the risk of exposure to pathogens that may be present on these packages. When riding shopping carts, infants and children should be placed in the child seats rather than the baskets of the carts. An option for older children is the use of alternative shopping carts designed with you know, stroller-like seats or miniature motor vehicles in front of the cart basket. 
placing raw meat and poultry products in the rack underneath the cart would also limit direct child product contact. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a debilitating condition characterized by a minimum of six months crushing mental and physical exhaustion, and we have no idea what causes it. We don't even have a good idea how many people even have it. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that as many as 7.5 million Americans currently suffer from it. And you know, we as physicians have very little to offer patients in terms of relieving those symptoms. So this is one of the conditions I'm always keeping an eye out for in terms of new treatments. And one of the latest they just discovered? Chocolate. Evidently, Montezuma II, who reigned the Aztec Empire 500 years ago, uh, noted this divine drink builds up resistance, fights fatigue, a cup of cocoa permits people to walk for a whole day without food. Not willing to take the emperor's word for it, it was put to the test. I'm always skeptical of industry-supported research, but it was actually a pretty good study. At first glance, it looked like they were basically saying, eat three chocolate bars a day for eight weeks and call me in the morning but it was actually a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial, which is about as good as you can get. The mad scientists over at Nestle uh, took white chocolate, dyed it brown, and then added some sort of fake chocolate flavor, such that people couldn't tell if they were eating the real chocolate or the fake. Comparable amounts of you know, sugar and fat, but one had cocoa solids, you know, phytonutrients, and the other basically didn't. So they were able to put people on one, and then switch them over without anyone knowing to see if their chronic fatigue symptoms got better or worse. And there was a significant improvement in the real chocolate group, meaning it apparently wasn't just the yummy taste of chocolate, but the action of the cacao phytonutrients. Of course, you know, no one should be eating three chocolate bars a day, but you can get the equivalent dose of cocoa solids, the equivalent dose of those wonderful cocoa phytonutrients, by consuming 2.5 tablespoons of cocoa powder a day. Uh, you can put it in coffee, you can make a chocolatey smoothie, or my personal favorite, you can blend it in a high-speed blender with frozen cherries or strawberries, a touch of non-dairy milk, vanilla extract, and some erythritol or some dates, and you have instant decadent chocolate ice cream. Low-fat, low-calorie, no cholesterol, no added sugar, chocolate ice cream. The more you eat, the healthier you are, whether or not you're suffering from chronic fatigue. Cholesterol doesn't just build up inside our coronary arteries, it builds up inside all of our arteries. In the heart, it can cause a heart attack. In the brain, it can cause a stroke. In our legs, it can cause peripheral vascular disease, and clogs in our pelvic arteries can lead to sexual dysfunction, and not just in men. Hyperlipidemia and sexual function in premenopausal women. Those with high cholesterol reported significantly lower arousal, orgasm, lubrication, and satisfaction atherosclerosis of the arterial bed supplying the female pelvic anatomy can lead to decreased vaginal engorgement and uh, clitoral erectile insufficiency syndrome, similar to erectile problems in men, resulting in vasculogenic female sexual dysfunction, an important factor of which may be this failure to achieve a clitoral tumescence or engorgement. Eating healthier can extend one's life and also one's love life. Every part of the body needs sufficient blood flow to function properly. Cholesterol can clog arteries in our inner and outer organs, causing heart attacks, strokes, and sexual dysfunction. But what about blood flow to our spine? Our spines are very vascular, and cholesterol clogs in the vertebral arteries can lead to the degeneration of our discs and lower back pain, the second leading cause of disability. Autopsy studies confirm what happens when your cholesterol gets too high. This is what the openings to the arteries in your back should look like on the left, and on the right you can see how clogged off they can become. With the standard Western diet, atheromatous plaques may begin to appear early in adult life, and by the age 20, roughly 10% of the population already has advanced lesions. Smoking 
and high serum cholesterol levels were found to have the most consistent associations with disc degeneration and low back pain. Much of back pain-related disability appears to be an open or shut case, depending on our diet. As noted in a recent article in the Harvard Health Letter, up to three-quarters of men with cholesterol-narrowed coronary arteries have some degree of erectile dysfunction as well. There's drugs like Viagra, but they're a temporary and expensive solution that can cause hazardous side effects. Obviously, if your arterial system is that damaged, a more intensive effort that involves much more than popping a pill can yield longer-term improvements in both sexual function and cardiovascular health. Plant-based diets can not only reverse both conditions, but one plant in particular may be able to play a stopgap role in the meantime. The way drugs like Viagra work is by inhibiting an enzyme that inactivates something called CGMP, which would otherwise dilate penile blood vessels. So enzyme inhibition means more CGMP, which means more blood flow. But there's another way to boost CGMP levels by going to the other side of the equation and stimulating the enzyme that makes it. That's what nitric oxide does. Nitric oxide is made from arginine. Arginine can be produced by citrulline, so I wonder what would happen if you ate more citrulline. Oral citrulline supplementation improves erection hardness in men with mild erectile dysfunction. And where is citrulline found? Watermelon. How much watermelon would you have to eat every day to match the dose they used in the study? Three and a half servings a day. Unless you eat yellow watermelon, which has about four times as much citrulline, so just you know, one serving a day, one wedge, one sixteenth of a modest melon, should uh, provide the dose they used, allowing for a 68% increase in monthly intercourse frequency which your heart should be able to handle, given how much lower your blood pressure will be with watermelon supplementation. Watermelons got it all. Second in spice popularity only to black pepper, cinnamon is the powdered inner bark of four different species of cinnamomum trees. There's Vietnamese cinnamon, Chinese cinnamon, Indonesian, and Ceylon. A recent review raised concerns about one of them because of a compound called coumarin, which new human data suggests may be toxic to the liver. It's been banned as a food additive, but still can be found naturally in Chinese cinnamon, also known as cassia cinnamon. It is not found in significant amounts in so-called true cinnamon, Ceylon cinnamon, and we don't have enough data on the other two. Now, these uh, traffic lights are not for recreational users. These are only for people going out of their way to add like a, a teaspoon or more to their daily diet, which ideally should be everyone, since it appears so health-promoting. Anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antioxidant, anti-tumor, cardiovascular, cholesterol-lowering, and immunomodulatory effects especially useful for those with diabetes or pre-diabetes. So if you're eating cinnamon every day, great. Just make sure it's the right kind. In the UK, if it's a cinnamon, then it's Ceylon cinnamon. Uh, Chinese cinnamon is labeled cassia. In the US, though, they can both just be labeled cinnamon, and since Chinese is cheaper, uh, that's what most cinnamon is on our shelf. So make sure it specifies Ceylon. In this recent study of 50,000 men and women, those who ate the most apples appeared to have significantly less risk of having a heart attack in the eight years they were followed. But those drinking apple juice appeared to increase their risk. That makes sense. Apples, like all whole plant foods, are packed with fiber, which may lower cholesterol, whereas juice consumption, no fiber, just sugar, has been tied to the risk of diseases like diabetes. So nothing new here, but what about this one? 20,000 men and women fall for 10 years, an estimated 34% lower risk of coronary heart disease for those with a high intake of fruits and vegetables, but they went a step further 
and compared raw versus cooked. No such study focusing specifically on raw versus processed fruit and vegetable consumption in relation to coronary heart disease incidents has ever been done until now. What do you think they found? Well, in the past we've learned that daily salad consumption, for example, may significantly decrease one's risk of dying from heart disease. In this study of 11,000 vegetarians and other health-conscious people, daily consumption of raw salad was associated with a 26% reduction in mortality from ischemic heart disease. So we know raw is good. At the same time, we've known for 15 years that phytonutrients like lycopene in tomatoes appear protective against heart disease, and cooking dramatically boosts lycopene bioavailability. Uh, this was actually an interesting study. You know, it's hard to trust what people tell you about what they eat. So instead, people admitted to the hospital for heart attacks had a plug of fat tissue taken from their butt and just had it analyzed to basically confirm how much tomato sauce they'd really been eating. So anyway, raw or cooked for heart disease prevention? And you probably guessed it. The answer is both. Can you name a fruit whose processed juice is healthier than just eating the fruit itself? Here's the VCEAC of fruits and their juice. The black bars are the fruit, the white bars are the juice. VCEAC stands for Vitamin C Equivalent Antioxidant Capacity. So for example, even though apples don't actually contain 150 mg of vitamin C itself, uh, they have other antioxidants that add up to the equivalent of that much antioxidant power. As you can see across the board, as you go from fruit to juice, the antioxidant capacity is slashed. In fact, the only reason the grape juice has even that high is because it happened to have extra vitamin C added, so kind of cheated. But wait a second, what's this? A fruit's juice that has significantly more antioxidants and even greater phytonutrient availability? And the answer is tomato juice. About twice the antioxidant power of tomatoes, and five times the phytonutrient lycopene. And no, it's not a trick question. You may use a tomato like a vegetable, but it's a fruit because it's got seeds. Don't tell that to the Supreme Court, though, who, having nothing better to do, ruled in 1893 that tomatoes were vegetables, though they were among the same justices that ruled Mr. Scott was not a citizen. So I wouldn't listen to them. Arkansas decided to have it both ways, declaring tomatoes both the official state fruit and the official state vegetable. The top three killers in the United States are no longer heart disease, cancer, and stroke. That was so 2010. Stroke moved down to number four. Number three is now COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, respiratory diseases like emphysema. We know we can prevent and even help treat the other top killers with diet. What about COPD? There's still some coal mining going on, but 80 to 90 percent is from smoking. So what does diet have to do with it? Well, Data dating back 50 years found that high intake of fruits and vegetables was positively associated with pulmonary function, lung function in general. But does that mean it could prevent COPD? There's been a burst of new research over the last 10 years to answer just that question. In 2002, we learned that every extra serving of fruit we add to our daily diet may reduce our risk of getting, and then eventually dying, from COPD. In 2006, we could add tea drinking to fruits and vegetables for COPD prevention. In 2007, a pair of studies emerged, one from Columbia, one from Harvard, implicating cured meat— you know, bacon, bologna, ham, hot dogs, sausage, salami— as a risk factor for developing COPD. 
They thought the nitrite preservatives in the meat may be mimicking the damage done by the nitrites from cigarette smoke. In 2008, Harvard decided to study women as well, and found the same thing. So now we know what to eat and what to stay away from. In 2009, uh, soy was added to the good list. Both uh, tofu and soy milk found protective against COPD, protective against breathlessness. 2009, more evidence for the benefits of vegetables, and 2010, the benefits of fiber, especially from whole grains. But this is the study we've all been waiting for. Sure, the antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects of plant foods can help prevent COPD, but what if you already have it? 120 COPD patients were randomized into two groups. Half were told to boost their fruit and vegetable consumption, the other half stayed on their regular diet. The intervention group was told to eat at least one more serving a day of fruits or vegetables. And they did, and they did for three years. More fruit and more vegetables than control. Here's the control group. Slowly but surely, they got worse. That's what happens in COPD, emphysema. You get worse and worse, then you die. The group told to eat at least one more measly serving of fruits or vegetables every day started out the same, but didn't get worse. One year, two year, three year? In fact, if anything, it looks like their lung function got a little better. That's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to get worse. Could be the antioxidant effect of fruits and vegetables. Could be the anti-inflammatory effect, or, frankly, it may not directly be the fruits and vegetables at all. When you eat more of one thing, you tend to eat less of another. For example, the addition of fruits and vegetables resulted in a decreased consumption of meat, which is known to be a pro-oxidant. Either way, though, there is now hope. These findings suggest that a dietary shift to higher antioxidant food intake may be associated with improvement in lung function, and in this respect, dietary interventions might be considered in COPD management. The tobacco industry viewed these landmark findings a little differently. Instead of adding fruits and vegetables to one's diet to treat emphysema, wouldn't it be simpler to just add them to the cigarettes? And voila! The addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently had a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Next, they're going to try to add berries to meat. I can always count on the journal, Meat Science. Now, adding fruit extracts to burgers was not without its glitches, though. The blackberries literally dyed burger patties with a distinct purplish color though infusing lamb carcasses with kiwi fruit juice before rigor mortis sets in does evidently improve tenderness, and it is possible to improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters with powdered grape seeds, though there were complaints that the grape seed particles were visible in the final product, and if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what goes in their food. The public health community sees the economic downturn differently than most. For example, gasoline prices going up? Great! In the coronary artery risk development in young adults study, they found that rising prices of gasoline may be associated with an unintended increase in physical activity. Every 25 cent increase in gasoline price was associated with about an extra 10 exercise units, uh, roughly equivalent to 17 minutes of additional walking per week for every extra quarter per gallon. What effect might the economic downturn have on healthy eating, though? Recently, researchers at Harvard compared the cost and healthfulness of various foods across the country, hunting for the best nutritional bargain. They conclude that people should purchase more nuts, soy, and beans, and whole grains, and less meat and dairy. Although spending more money was associated with a healthier diet, large improvements in diet may be achieved without increased spending. The purchase of plant-based foods may offer the best investment for dietary health.
Remember the arachidonic acid story? We make it, but we can also get it in our diet, eating other animals that make it. Uh, same thing with cholesterol. Well, uh, there are similar necessary components found exclusively, or almost exclusively, in the animal kingdom, not the plant kingdom, uh, such as uh, cornicine, cornitine, creatine, and taurine. But if something's made only by animals, what about those eating vegetarian? Thankfully, vegetarians are animals too, so they make it themselves. Now, true carnivores are the exception. Right? Cats don't make taurine, for example, but that's because they're built to eat animals that do. But humans produce all these compounds on their own, unless they have some rare genetic inborn error of metabolism birth defect there is actually a hereditary disease that may affect as many as 1 in 40,000 births. It's a mutation on chromosome 5 of a carnitine transport protein. They actually make enough carnitine, but because of the birth defect end up peeing too much out, and so develop a carnitine deficiency. And actually, there was a case report about 30 years ago of a 10-year-old boy in Israel in and out of the hospital every four or five months. No one knew what was going on. The clue only came when he decided to go meat-free, and that made things worse. Then he started uh, you know, having attacks every three weeks. Turns out he had that rare disorder. That's why he was sick. But it was being kept somewhat at bay by the exogenous external dietary source of carnitine in the meat that the other you know, 39,999 kids out of the 40,000 don't need. He stayed vegetarian, but they gave him high-dose carnitine supplements, and at the time of the report he was 12 and completely cured. The brain only takes up about 2% of body weight, but may use up to 25% of the body's energy. We have supercomputers in our heads, and they drain a lot of power. That's where this molecule comes in creatine. It acts as a quick reserve energy boost when your fuel supply, oxygen and blood sugar, is running low. Creatine is naturally produced in our liver, kidneys, and pancreas, and transported to the brain and our muscles, the two places we need the most rapid energy deployment. Now, if you were to take a Hannibal Lecter bite out of someone, would that extra creatine you eat on top of what you're already making give your brain a boost? That study might not get past the ethics board, but this one did. The influence of creatine supplementation on the cognitive functioning of vegetarians and omnivores. In this simplified, normalized version of the data, before the creatine supplement was consumed, the memory capacity of the vegetarians and meat-eaters were similar— uh, vegetarians in white, meat-eaters in black. Uh, so they started out about the same place. However, after four days of consuming a creatine supplement, memory was better in vegetarians compared to those who consumed meat, whereas in those who were meat-eaters, the consumption of the creatine supplement was associated with poorer memory compared to baseline. So uh, the vegetarians got a brain boost, but the meat-eaters didn't. This may be because meat-eaters have down-regulated creatine synthesis. Their body doesn't make a whole lot because they get it in their diet by eating muscles. Maybe not this kind of calf, but at least maybe this one. So their body is like, why bother? whereas the vegetarians are cranking out the stuff all the time, so when they take a creatine supplement, it may be like they're getting a double dose. They're getting what they take in addition to what they already make. Still too early to tell what's really going on, but in the meanwhile, if you eat vegetarian, should you consider taking creatine supplements? Creatine. Are the benefits worth, worth the risk? This is in the context of sports supplementation. Uh, that was actually asked more generally of the editors-in-chief of the Harvard Health Letter recently, to which he replied, For now, to be on the safe side, I'd advise against taking creatine, concerned that creatine supplements might contain toxic impurities. Uh, was he just being paranoid? Nope. Levels of, of organic contaminants and heavy metals in creatine supplements. 
They tested 33 different brands on the market and found a whopping 50% of them exceeded the maximum level recommended by the European Food Safety Authority for at least one contaminant. Cases of cheese mite dermatitis date back over 60 years in the United States, also known as cheese itch, though typically considered vermin by the food industry, affecting harder cheeses like aged cheddar in particular, they're sometimes intentionally added to cheese for added flavor. In the Journal of Dairy Science, the various species were recently identified. When cheese is ripened with mites, a nutty, fruity flavor and aroma evidently develops. The placement of the anal suckers can evidently be used to help differentiate between the different types uh, to make sure you put the right one in the cheese. Here is a video of the little suckers in action, ripening the cheese, developing the nutty, fruity flavor and aroma. Positively appetizing, though, compared to some other cheese-making practices. The Cheese skipper is sometimes present in well-aged cheese and a proof of its quality. The cheese skipper doesn't sound so bad until you realize they're talking about cheese infested with maggots of the cheese fly. The larvae are the well-known cheese skippers. They can cause intestinal infections, even urinary tract infections. Normally, the insects are just contaminants, but there is a spider cheese equivalent of the maggot world, and that's called Kesu morzu, a soft cheese intentionally riddled with thousands of maggots of the cheese fly to aid in fermentation, evidently because the larvae can launch themselves for distance up to, distances up to 15 centimeters. Diners are said to hold their hands above their sandwiches to prevent the maggots from leaping into their face. Evolution devised an ingenious way to bond infant to mother. Select for milk proteins that break down into peptides that have opiate-like drug effects. But what if the breastfeeding mother is herself effectively suckling by still drinking milk as an adult. Evolution never counted on that, which may explain this recent report in the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. Cow's milk induced infant apnea with increased serum content of bovine beta casomorphin 5. Uh, that's one of the opioid compounds formed in our stomachs when we drink milk. Infant apnea means when a baby stops breathing they report a case of a breastfed infant with recurrent apnea episodes, which have always been preceded by his mother's consumption of fresh cow's milk. A biochemical examination has revealed a high level of casomorphin in the child's blood. They speculate that it is an opioid activity that may have a depressive effect on the respiratory center in the central nervous system and induce a phenomenon they coin milk apnea. The reason we're so concerned is that about 7-10% to of infants with recurrent apneic episodes cannot be saved, and they die of sudden infant death syndrome. The researchers hooked the kid up to a monitor and wanted to give him some cow's milk to provoke a reaction on tape, but the boy's mother did not grant consent for his oral provocation with cow's milk because of her fears for the child's life. She finally relented, though, and when the boy was four months old, attempted to provoke him with milk, after which an apparent life-threatening event reoccurred. Presently, the 21-month-old boy is kept on a milk-free diet and has no more symptoms. The aim of the present report, they conclude, is to draw researchers' attention to the possibility of occurrence of a systemic reaction with an apnea seizure on the infant's exposure to the proteins in cow's milk. We are convinced that such a clinical situation occurs rarely. However, it is accompanied by a real threat to the infant's life that can be avoided when applying a simple and not costly dietetic intervention, a dairy-free diet. This report on cow's milk-induced infant apnea thought due to the opiate-like effects of bovine casomorphin in milk, was 
just a single case report. It was so provocative, though, researchers immediately started testing other kids. SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, also known as crib death, is the leading cause of death for healthy infants after one month of age. One in every 2,000 American babies die this way. Every day, six babies stop crying, and six parents start. Most susceptible are infants exposed to several postnatal factors— uh, sleeping on their stomachs, a secondhand smoke, high sleep room temperatures. But it is supposed that in some cases of SIDS, it is cow's milk that may play a certain role. It is also suspected that beta-casomorphines hold a direct responsibility for that situation. Beta-casomorphines are biologically active with, as its name suggests, effects similar to that of morphine. Penetration of beta-casomorphines into the infant's immature central nervous system may inhibit the respiratory center in the brainstem, leading to abnormal ventilatory responses. Uh, hypercapnia, which means too much carbon dioxide, hypoxia, not enough oxygen, apnea, and death. So what they did was study infants who had recurrent life-threatening episodes, meaning apnea, where they stop breathing, or turn blue, or become limp, etc. These are the kinds of events that place babies at high risk for SIDS. The blood levels of bovine casomorphin in the babies with the acute life-threatening events average three times higher than healthy babies. Why? Well, there's an enzyme that gets rid of casomorphin and the activity of that enzyme in the affected group was only half that of the healthy kids. So some babies may just not be able to clear it out of their systems fast enough and are placed at risk for death. Attacks of apnea, where babies temporarily stop breathing, and muscular atony, where babies go limp after exposure to cow's milk, may also be explained by extracentral activity of casomorphin, meaning outside the brain. Casomorphin, this opiate-like peptide produced by cow's milk, is also responsible for triggering pseudo-allergic reactions and other abnormalities seen in crib death. And moreover, similar to morphine, they delay the gastric emptying time, and so may increase the risk of infants refluxing stomach contents back up into their lungs. Uh, thus, it can be said that the so-called milk apnea effect may consist of several components— an opioid-induced respiratory depression, an opioid-induced pseudoallergic histamine-related respiratory response, an influence on the peripheral nervous system, a cow's milk-induced reflux, followed by aspiration-induced apnea. Sudden infant death syndrome is not the only condition linked to these morphine-like compounds. From another medical journal recently, casomorphins liberated from the cow's milk protein, beta casein, are accused of participating in the cause of such conditions as autism, crib death, type 1 diabetes, postpartum psychosis, circulatory disorders, and food allergies. In terms of autism risk, whereas the human casomorphins, which are the only ones found in the breast milk of women who don't drink cow's milk, are associated with normal psychomotor development and muscle tone. In contrast, elevated levels of bovine casomorphin, found in cow's milk-based uh, formula-fed infants, for example, was associated with a delay in psychomotor development and muscle spasticity. This evidence suggests that the inability of some infants to adequately eliminate bovine casomorphin may be a risk factor for delay in psychomotor development and other diseases such as autism. The National Dairy Council denies that milk intake causes acne, citing the American Academy of Dermatology. Let's take a peek, shall we, at the official journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, the Harvard Nurses Study, no less, a study in fact supported by the National Dairy Council itself. High school dietary dairy intake and teenage acne. They studied 47,000 women. What did they find? We found a positive association with acne for intake of total milk and skim milk. 
we hypothesize that the association with milk may be because of the presence of hormones and bioactive molecules in milk. Yeah, but there's a difference between association and causation. From the accompanying editorial in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, the papers from the Harvard School of Public Health establish an association between milk consumption and acne. But how could milk cause acne? Because drinking milk and consuming dairy products from pregnant cows exposes us to the hormones produced by the cow's pregnancy, hormones that we were not designed to consume during our teenage and adult years. It is no secret that teenagers' acne closest par closely parallels hormonal activity. So what happens if exogenous hormones are added to the normal endogenous load? And what exactly is the source of these hormones? Uh, consider that in nature, milk is consumed from a mother, whether human or bovine, until weaning occurs. Normally, the mother then ceases lactation before the next pregnancy occurs, uh, so that consuming milk from a mother pregnant with her next offspring is not a common occurrence. You know, we've all seen nature films of animals you know, chasing their offspring away to encourage weaning at the appropriate time. Further, in nature, the offspring consumes only the milk of its own species, uh, but both of these natural rules are broken by humans. Viewed objectively, human consumption of large amounts of another species' milk, especially when that milk comes mainly from pregnant cows during the human's normally post-weaned years, is essentially unnatural. The Harvard Nurses Study, published in the prestigious journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, funded in part by none other than the National Dairy Council itself, found that the association between milk intake during adolescence and severe physician-diagnosed teenage acne was even more marked for skim milk than for other forms of milk. This may be because there's so much more estrogen in skim milk. Researchers found 15 steroid sex hormones in commercial milk right off the shelves, and the highest levels were found in skim milk, compared to 2% and whole. This study involved asking women what they ate years ago in high school, though. I mean, who can even remember? So the next year, Harvard researchers studied milk consumption and acne in adolescent girls directly, following 6,000 girls aged 9 through 15 for a few years, and found the same thing, a positive link between intake of milk and acne. Maybe it's just girls, though? So next they studied milk consumption and acne in teenage boys. And here we go again, a positive association between intake of skim milk and acne. And it doesn't appear to be an issue with you know, bovine growth hormone injections or added steroids. This is just what milk contains naturally. It should surprise no one that milk contains such a heavy complement of growth-enhancing hormones. Milk is, after all, specifically designed to make things grow. Here's the latest update, published 2011. Evidence for the acne-promoting effects of milk. Though acne is an epidemic skin disease in Western countries, afflicting more than 85% of adolescents, Acne is absent in non-Western populations which do not consume milk and dairy products. They go on to review all the studies which I've already talked about. By million years of evolution, they conclude, the growth signaling system of mammalian milk is exclusively and physiologically provided to the newborn only during the nursing period. The chronic abuse of this mammalian postnatal signaling system by widespread cow milk and dairy consumption in humans of industrialized societies has been proposed to be the major cause of the acne epidemic and the more serious chronic Western diseases. There's lots of diseases associated with unrestricted growth. So what should we do? There are two solutions to this problem. The restriction of milk protein consumption or we somehow engineer milk that doesn't have these effects. Either way, both restriction of milk consumption or the generation of less insulin-affecting milk will have an enormous impact on the prevention of epidemic Western diseases like obesity, diabetes, cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and 
acne. When it comes to fruits and vegetables, it's not only quality and quantity, but also variety. We know, for example, spinach is healthier than lettuce, and a big salad is better than small. But is it better to get the spring greens mescaline mix than even the straight spinach? Is it healthier to eat one apple and one orange than it is to eat three apples or three oranges? An interesting pair of studies was recently released that uh, looked at disease risk and the variety of fruit and vegetable consumption. And I think we're used to some of the more generic plant compounds like vitamin C, which is uh, sprinkled throughout the plant kingdom, whereas there are specific phytonutrients produced by specific plants to perform specific functions both in their organs and ours, and we miss out on them if we're stuck in a fruit and vegetable rut, even if every day we're eating a lot. There are tens of thousands of phytonutrients, but they're not evenly distributed throughout the plant kingdom. Those wonderful uh, glucosinolates I've talked about uh, are found almost exclusively in the cabbage family. You don't get lemonoids like lemonin and lemonol or uh, tangeritin in apples, for example. Comparing apples and oranges is like comparing apples and oranges. In a sense, though, all fruits are just fruits, whereas vegetables can be any other part of the plant. Roots harbor different nutrients than shoots. Uh, carrots are roots, uh, celery and rhubarb are stems, dark green leafies are leaves, uh, peas are pods, and cauliflower is, true to its name, a collection of flower buds. But all fruits are just fruits, so it may be even more important to get in a variety of vegetables so you can benefit from all parts of the plant. And that's indeed what they found. One of the reasons some studies haven't shown more impressive results tying disease reduction to the quantity of fruit and vegetable consumption may be because of the quality of fruit and vegetable consumption. People are more likely to eat bananas than blueberries, more likely to eat cucumbers instead of kale. Variety is also important, though. If in one of these studies you ate a whole cantaloupe, you would be recorded getting eight servings of fruits or vegetables. One head of iceberg lettuce makes ten cups. We know that whole foods are better than eating individual nutrients. For example, a carrot is better than a beta-carotene pill because of what's called nutrient synergy, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts as many of the nutrients interact, work together, complement one another. But what about synergy between foods? Check this out. I've talked about the wonders of the spice turmeric, but the key component of turmeric has very poor bioavailability. Just a tiny bit gets into our bloodstream after eating a nice curry, unless we add some black pepper. The phytonutrient in black pepper boosts the level of the turmeric phytonutrient 2,000%. That's why dietary diversity is so important. Not only may the variety of fruit and vegetable consumption decrease disease risk independent from quantity of consumption, sometimes variety may even be more important. Check this out. No difference in inflammation, C-reactive protein levels, between those eating six servings of vegetables a day and those eating two servings but those eating the more variety, even if they didn't necessarily eat greater overall quantities, had significantly less inflammation. This supports the American Heart Association's latest dietary guidelines, which, for the first time, added a recommendation for also eating a variety of fruits and vegetables. More than a million Americans are blind. The four common causes are cataracts, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, and diabetes. This is normal vision. This is with cataracts, this is with glaucoma, this is with macular degeneration, and this is with diabetic retinopathy. And if left untreated, they can all end up looking like this. We know diabetes, the leading cause of new cases of blindness, 
and amputations and kidney failure can be prevented, managed, uh, treated, even cured with a plant-based diet. But what about the other three common causes of blindness? Researchers recently looked at the connection between overall diet quality and age-related macular degeneration, but diet quality based on whose criteria? They based it on the Alternative Healthy Eating Index, developed by Harvard. You basically get scored 1 through 10 based on each food group. If you consume five servings of vegetables a day, for example, your vegetable score is a 10. Four servings of fruits a day gets you a perfect fruit score. If you eat vegetarian, you get a perfect 10 in the meat department. Then you know, more whole foods, less trans fats, etc. And based on these criteria, they concluded that advanced age-related macular degeneration was significantly related to overall diet quality. Glaucoma is a deterioration of our optic nerve, the nerve that connects our eyes to our brain, and is second only to cataracts at the world's leading cause of blindness. The weird thing is that we still don't know what causes it, and so there's a desperate search for environmental or dietary influences. The most protective dietary component, decreasing the odds of glaucoma by 69%, consuming at least one serving a month of collard greens or kale, just once a month or more. And the silver and bronze metals go to weekly carrot and then peach consumption. We think it may be the lutein and zeaxanthin, two yellow plant pigments found mostly in greens, that seem to know right where to go. They hone right into our retinas and appear to protect against degenerative eye disease. Lycopene is the red pigment in tomatoes so protective against prostate cancer. Guess where it goes when a man eats a tomato? Straight to the prostate. Beta-carotene in foods may prevent ovarian cancer. It builds up in the ovaries. And where does our body need the lutein and zeaxanthin? In our retinas to protect our eyesight, and that's exactly where it goes. They not only protect, but improve our vision. Their peak light absorbance just so happens to be just at the wavelength of the color of our planet's sky. And so by filtering out that blue haze on a clear day standing on top of a mountain, Individuals with high macular pigment, lutein and zeaxanthine, phytonutrients from greens, may be able to distinguish distant mountain ridges up to 27 miles further than individuals with little or no pigment. The leading cause of blindness and vision loss is cataracts, one of the most common surgeries performed today. We know smoking can increase risk, long-term radiation exposure. What about diet? A study of more than 25,000 people with a wide range of diets was recently published. They compared what they called high meat eaters to moderate meat eaters to low meat eaters versus those who ate fish but no other meat versus those eating vegetarian versus those eating vegan. The researchers went out of their way to choose health-conscious subjects so they could factor out smoking, exercise, other non-diet variables. And so the so-called high meat-consuming group, 100 grams a day. That's like one serving in one meal a day. In the U.S., we may average closer to 330 grams a day. So it's like reverse Starbucks labeling. You know how they're small as a tall? Well, here their high meat group is really quite low by American standards. Yet they still found a highly significant trend. Who do you think had the lowest risk of cataracts? Compared with the quote-unquote high meat group, cutting back on meat cuts down your risk about 15%. Just do fish, you're down 21%. No fish, 30% drop in risk. And then no eggs and dairy for the full 40% drop in risk. Overall, compare with meat eaters who consumed 100 grams of meat and meat products a day, fish eaters, vegetarians, and vegans had approximately 20, 30, and 40% lower risk of cataract, respectively. It's like with diabetes risk. There appears to be a stepwise reduction, a progressive decrease in risk in parallel with the decrease in the amount of meat and other animal products in the diet. Thank you so much for watching and your interest in my work. If any questions have arisen while watching this, please go to nutritionfacts.org, post the question, and I will do my best to answer it.